Welcome back to the Plowcast. This is episode four of the series covering the latest issue of the magazine, Made Perfect. Today, we'll be speaking with bioethicist and Emory professor Rosemary Garland Thompson and with J.D. Flynn about being the father of children with Down syndrome. I'm Susanna Black, senior editor at Plow Quarterly. And I'm Peter Momsen, editor-in-chief of Plow. This is the episode where we talk about physical difference, parenthood, and how receiving children as gifts changes the way we live in the world. First off, we're honored to have on the podcast Rosemary Garland Thompson. Rosemary is a disability justice activist and scholar and writer. She's a professor of English and bioethics at Emory University. Rosemary is co-editor of About Us, essays from the New York Times about disability by people with disabilities, which is forthcoming, and the author of Staring, How We Look, and several other books. Her current project is Embracing Our Humanity, a Bioethics of Disability and Health. Welcome, Rosemary. Could you describe your background and how you came to do the work that you're doing? Thank you very much for having me. I am an English professor. I've been working to, as we say, develop uh, disability studies um, in higher education, particularly in the humanities. And I'd like to come back to that a little bit um, for the last 20 years. And the reason I started doing this is that around 20 years ago in English departments and in uh, critical theory, uh, there were lots of important questions being raised about uh, women and women's culture and the inclusion of women in the knowledge base as well as the inclusion of people of color, black people, brown people in the knowledge base uh, of what counts as knowledge. And I began to understand then that people with disabilities or disability as a concept and a community also had not been explored in this way and was omitted from what counts as knowledge. And so I was able to make those connections between what we call then feminist theory and women and gender studies and critical race studies um, to work on developing disability studies and work on connecting disability culture and disability justice, if you will, to uh, education and to knowledge making and to teaching. Why, why was it that you were interested in disability studies in general? Like I was born in what we now call a pre-disability rights and pre-ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act era. Uh, and I was born with a pretty significant uh, congenital disability. I have... Um, what I call very unusual arms and hands. And like many people with disabilities, especially early on in life, there was no one in my family with a disability. I didn't know anyone with a disability. So although I recognize myself as something different from other people, I had no idea about I had no disability consciousness. I had no political consciousness actually at all in any way until I was well into graduate school and began to understand the possible parallels between something like the black civil rights movement, the disability rights movement, the broader human and civil rights movement. Right, so uh, one, Part of, part of the work you've been doing is uh, focused on the phenomenon of, of so-called curing diseases, uh, either by genetically erasing uh, human beings who have certain genetic ca- characteristics in the case of CRISPR, or by actively uh, killing human fetuses, say with Down syndrome. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that work uh, in regard to uh, those who are judged to be genetically inferior. And are there links between these two issues? What are the distinctions too? I think we have to back up a little bit, if you will, uh, and to think about the large changes uh, that we consider to be modernization or modernity, the things that uh, 
make it different for us living now from say people who lived um, that we know at least through historians four, five, 600 years ago. So one significant difference is that what we think of as medicine or science is now the template for understanding that most people in what we think of as the rich or the developed world now use in understanding themselves. So this is a significant shift from other more traditional ways of understanding people or templates of understanding that might have to do with divine authority. But scientific author authority, pardon me, scientific authority would suggest that um, there are ways of being in the world that we call diseases and that these diseases are that which should be extirpated from the human experience. And it does make a lot of sense to think about it that way. So in some ways, this is what we sometimes call the medical model, that is to say a medical understanding of human existence. And that has some great benefits, but it also has some limitations. So the idea of disease itself and the conceptualization, a kind of scientific medical conceptualization of, of human existence is kind of what we wanna ask questions about. So one important question is, what human variations count as disease and why does that matter? And when we think about the ethics of different biomedical practices and the development of different kinds of biomedical technologies like gene editing, like selective testing, like euthanasia, like um, selective termination, these really complex ethical questions that relate to practices that have to do with life and death, what we wanna be able to think about is not just which diseases should be eliminated from the human experience and condition, but what kinds of human variations count as disease and why does that matter? Some of the work that you were, were doing um, served to contribute to this big Atlantic piece that I think you know, a lot of our readers might, or listeners might know about, which is called The Last Children of Down Syndrome, about the um, phenomenon of, is it Iceland? Which is it, is Iceland the country that has? Denmark, Denmark is the Denmark. country that the article focuses on, but right. stand to, there are several of the Nordic countries who are in a similar situation. Right. right, and the way that they put it is that they have eliminated Down syndrome from their countries, and this is like, you know, thought of as this great sort of achievement of medical science. Um, what they mean, of course, is that they've eliminated people with Down syndrome because they don't, you know, they haven't like cured Down syndrome. They've, you know, killed in utero the, the people who would be otherwise the, Down, the people with Down syndrome in that society. Um, there's, and it, the way that it's put is often um, in terms of kind of the choices that parents um, or potential parents is the way that probably they would think of it, um, might make about the kinds of children that they want. Um, you talk about, you had a great, absolutely stunning phrase that I loved of um, the phrase velvet eugenics which I think really challenges the idea that autonomy and consent and market style decision-making are a kind of morally neutral um, version of eugenics. Well, you know, Mengele or Buck versus Bell in the United States, um, the decision that required um, so-called feeble-minded um, women to be sterilized uh, involuntarily, you, you sort of challenge the whole um, concept that, you know, voluntary sort of euthanasia is better or market-based euthanasia is better. Can you talk a little bit about that? Of course, it's important to make uh, a clarification about the reference. And that is uh, that it's a reference to what we sometimes call the velvet revolution, which occurred in 1989 and in the early 1990s in uh, Eastern, well, Central Europe, 
uh, and in Europe in general, and in many places around the world, in which um, a revolution, a political and social revolution took place uh, without the explicit military violence that we usually associate with revolutions. Uh, in other words, people did not die for a political regime to change. And I think this is um, a good comparison because it is imagined that uh, the elimination of say people with Down syndrome, and it's the very best example, is some sort of progress toward making happier and healthier families and communities. And Down syndrome as a way of being in the world is in my view, the best case study or iconic example of what we ought not to be doing in relation to biomedical ethics. Down syndrome was the first genetic condition to be tested for, at least in the United States, but I think worldwide in the mid 1960s because it could be tested for so easily. And there was a certain logic of testing for Down syndrome at that time, prenatally, because people with Down syndrome born into the world then didn't have very high quality of life very often. Um, that was in part because of the recommendations and the treatments available for the medical conditions that often accompany Down syndrome. Uh, it was very common that the recommendation then for uh, a family who had a child with Down syndrome was to institutionalize them. And of course, we know that people don't do well at all in institutional settings. Uh, there were also fewer treatments for the kinds of medical conditions that accompany often Down syndrome and that people with Down syndrome uh, live with over a lifetime. But that has changed dramatically since the 1960s. And yet what has not changed is the urgency uh, of testing for Down syndrome as the, as I said, iconic condition that we think creates a burden on families and low quality of life. What I say is that there's a great irony right now, and that is that someone born with Down syndrome in a place like the United States now, in a rich country, uh, if they are born into a relatively middle-class family, they have the highest quality of life that anyone with Down syndrome has ever had in all of human history. And yet, this is a kind of person that is being eliminated from the human population at a rate of 90% or over. So how to explain this is complicated and important. And I certainly don't have a full explanation of it. Part of it is that once a technology or a practice is in place, we know that it's very hard to change that set of practices. It's like turning a ship around when it's headed toward an iceberg, it's not an easy thing to do. So that's part of, of, uh, of the dilemma, if you will, or part of the way that the practice continues. But it also continues because we have a very well-established narrative that disability, especially disability that involves appearance or disability that involves anything that we think might be uh, a kind of reduction of cognitive capability or any kind of a disability that we think might 
lead to a lower quality of life or a need for a great deal of healthcare resource uh, investment. These are the human conditions that we are most, that most underlie our logic of eliminating people who fall into those categories. In other words, instead of addressing fully the socioeconomic and political problems, we are still going directly to eliminating the people that are most subject to these political and social problems. I mean, there's also, there's a distinction, it seems to me, between, you know, not necessarily distinction such that you'd be like, well, this is the, this is the version that's the problem and this is not a problem, but there is a distinction between, you know, eliminating people who, you know, are fetuses who are already in the womb with Down syndrome and then like gene editing, editing genes such that the fetuses who are implanted and then born are the kind of people that you want them to be. They both seem to me to be quite creepy and, um, but in slightly different ways. Well, yes, I think we have a real moral and philosophical dilemma that that we really are talking about. Um, and that is, where does a distinctive human life begin? And we have made the pragmatic choice, and it makes a lot of sense why we've made this choice, to put birth as the threshold for full legal and moral humanity. And that's been a pragmatic choice that has been necessary in order for us to move forward um, in assuring that women have reproductive liberty. On the other hand, we know both scientifically and morally, that if what matters about what it means to be human is our individual distinctiveness, we do know that the distinctive individual is established upon conception with an embryo and there certainly is an enormous difference between an embryo and its genetic distinctiveness and a full born, a newborn in its genetic distinctiveness, but is it, it is in fact a continuum. And if we eliminate uh, intentionally, um, an embryo or a fetus on the basis that we object to its distinctive humanness, its distinctive human profile, if you will, then we are in some ways acting against one of the most significant moral principles of modernity, and that is the recognition of the individual value of each distinctive human being as being equal under the law, under the eyes of God, depending on what sort of authority that you want to claim, that the value and worth and equality of human individual distinctiveness is an important moral and political value. So it becomes a really difficult dilemma where we have to think about balancing harms and benefits in order to establish policy and practice. And I think that's why uh, we have such strongly felt uh, 
conflicts uh, about what kinds of policies and practices we're actually going to carry out. It seems to me that uh, our, our culture sort of is trying to hold two truths, uh, two things as true at the same time. And one is uh, there is the 2007 UN Convention on the Rights of the, the, the Disabled. There's in U.S. law, uh, there's protections for people with disabilities enshrined in the U.K. as well in the Equalities Act. Uh, <clears throat> the principle of, of full dignity for those with disabilities uh, is affirmed. And yet with the other side of, uh, of the mouth, so to speak, um, there's an assumption that a life with a disability is inherently uh, to be avoided. How do you how do you think about uh, the apparent way that you know we say two things about disability in our culture? Well, exactly. I think you're um, you're describing very well the kinds of inherent conflicts and contradictions and paradoxes, if you will, that exist in well, that, that are present in human existence. And I think the best thing uh, for us to do uh, as a human community is to recognize uh, these conflicts and contradictions, these paradoxes. I like that word better than conflicts. Conflicts, um, I think, suggest too much like, you know, wars and fighting and battling, which is a language that I think we've exhausted and ought to turn away from. And to think about how we have to mutually respect each of the perspectives, not the sides, but the perspectives uh, as shared perspectives and to recognize that these paradoxes exist everywhere and then to try to move forward. And this is the difficult thing with reasonable solutions, which would be laws and practices and policies that try to respect both perspectives, even though these perspectives are in contradiction to one another when carried out in practice and to be willing to compromise and to be resourceful about other solutions I'd like to see more conversation directed at uh, over the issue of abortion or specifically selective termination. That is to say abortion on the basis of um, the presence of characteristics such as sex, but certainly also such as disability, more fruitful conversations about how both perspectives can be res respected and what kinds of practices and policies can be put forward that are compromises to absolute positions, but at least address respectfully the positions of both perspectives. And I, I think it's and tragic would not be overstating it that we can't seem to do this in any way uh, more productive than these terrible ad hominem attacks and these defensive uh, platitudes. Um, it's very unfortunate. Many people actually have talked about like the need to sort of put a moratorium on things like human gene uh, germline research until we come to some sort of, you know, cultural conclusion about these questions. I, and I do, you know, obviously politically, we live in a world with each other and we care about each other and, you know, we're committed to seeking out, or at least I, I many of us are committed out to seeking out a kind of shared common good and as much as possible, a shared moral language. But at the same time, it does seem to me that there are perspectives that I think that it's proper to not respect, even if someone who, you know, even if someone holds them very strongly, and even if it might be the case that there is an ethical intuition at the core of their perspective that should be honored, it seems to me that like trying to draw out whatever good in that perspective 
um, is 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 more is is more important than just saying, well, you you know you have this strong belief, for example, that um, someone with Down syndrome does not have a life that's worthy of life. Maybe the intuition that you have is that human flourishing is a good and that you know you you feel as though someone with down syndrome doesn't couldn't flourish in the way that you would want ideally your child to or something i can understand that that's where someone's coming from but at the same time i feel as though i don't there there are things that we can't compromise on and it seems to me that like the worthwhileness of each person as a person um whatever their genetic difference whatever their you know forget genetic difference like whatever their um history whatever their um you know life experience including experience of suffering is that's something that i i feel like it's okay to not compromise on but as we talk about but i also think that there is a way to talk about that without as you say getting into the kind of like platitudes or ad, ad hominems or assumptions of, of bad faith that often accompany those conversations. Does that make sense to you at all? Or am I being too rigid? I have found that I agree with you, what you're saying. In other words, every perspective is not legitimate. Uh, mm -hmm. And every perspective cannot be accepted, cannot be morally acceptable. Uh, mm -hmm. That said, there is much more latitude than we are recognizing now for compromise and for recognizing uh, a variety of different perspectives. But I remember, as I said, an English teacher. And what I mean by that is that I have um, worked with uh, primarily narratives. Um, okay. And so I have a couple of things to say. Uh, one is that I decided to develop an expertise in bioethics to become a bioethicist, as I say. And I've done that over the last several years, in part because bioethics as a uh, enterprise is an applied enterprise where literary studies is uh, more of a theoretical enterprise that has to do with meaning making and representation and interpretation. So bioethics draws from religious studies and philosophy and medicine and to a lesser degree social science. But one of the elements of bioethics that I particularly appreciate is the concept of principalism. And principalism uh, puts forward four principles. One is autonomy, another is justice, and the other two are a pair that I find very compelling. One is the concept of doing good, and the other is the concept of doing no harm. And one of the compelling things about bioethics, and this is not exactly universally agreed upon amongst bioethic bioethicists, but one of the elements of principalism is that do no harm is more important than doing good. And that's a conservatism that's fundamental in bioethics. Therefore, in Practices such as selective termination or gene editing or euthanasia or even the cliche of fighting disease or battling cancer, it might be wisest for us to take up the premise or the principle of first do no harm which is implicit and uh, involved in the, the uh, Hippocratic Oath. Um, and this would lead us say to something like, rather than eliminating people with Down syndrome in an effort to improve humanity, reduce economic burden and make everyone happier, instead, let's do no harm to this 
if you will, population of human beings. You know, I did not grow up pro-life at all. I am now very strongly pro-life. Um, and so I feel like I, you know, most of the people, you know, most of the women in my family are still very pro-choice. And so I've had a lot of conversations about this, but it does seem like looking at the individual, you know, either person or potential person or whatever you, what, whatever your um, conception of the fetus is and saying, maybe there is a person, maybe there, I don't know whether there is a person there or not, but an ethic of caution and an ethic of sort of a duty of care to be, to make um, conservative choices that, that don't, conservative in the sense of like, if I don't know that this is a person, um, it might be, if I don't know that, I should probably be quite careful about what I do with that being, that creature. Um, and I should probably maybe avoid doing harm to, to him or her or to it. That's exactly the like. application of what I'm talking about in this particular yeah. Yeah. Uh, area. Well, one important thing to uh, bring up is the uh, concept of suffering uh, because it is imagined that living with a disability uh, is an occasion for suffering, for suffering more than living a life without a disability. And this is a, a false narrative that I think we really need to address. Human beings suffer and they suffer unequally and they suffer for a variety of different reasons. We suffer because we're human. We suffer because we have bodies. We suffer because we depend upon one another. We suffer because we die and the people we love and care about die. So suffering is built in to human existence, but the myth or the error is to imagine that people with disabilities suffer more than people who are non-disabled. And that's something I think we really have to unseat. And we can do that with coming back to my work as a narrative humanist or a English teacher. And that is we can do that most effectively, I think by bringing forward what I call narrative evidence about what it means to be human and what it means to live a human life in the scale of an actual human life. And so what that means is stories, to bring stories forward of life, life lived with suffering, life lived without suffering, life lived well. Uh, these individual stories of the rich variety of human life are what we need to bring into the conversation, which is over-dominated, I guess that's redundant, that's dominated by um, what I call counting evidence, that is to say statistics, measurement, counting, the kind of evidence that doesn't really comport with human experience. So we need stories to put up against numbers uh, because it's numbers and it's measurements and it's statistics that give us things like quality of life evaluations uh, which are largely measurements of what we think of as disability, um, uh, against which you know judgments are made and resources are distributed on the basis of these things. So that's yeah. part of what I um, am calling for as well is a different kind of knowledge uh, yeah. to balance off the uh, the preferences for statistical or counting knowledge that medical science have give, has given us uh, in the modern era. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you. Yes, thanks for the opportunity. And I look forward to learning from you and from Plow and from your um, community. Thank you. Now we'll welcome J.D. Flynn. J.D. is co-founder and editor-in-chief of The Pillar, a Catholic news site, 
is the father of three children, two of whom have Down syndrome, and is an advocate for the full inclusion of people with disabilities into the life of the church. Welcome, JD. One of the things that I wanted to talk about today um, was something that you had tweeted about recently. You had talked about this um, New York Times piece that came out, uh, I guess it was about a week and a half ago or something like that, um, which was a study that they had done um, showing that uh, for pre certain kinds of prenatal testing, the sort of what, what are called micro deletions tests, um, approximately 85% of all results are wrong. Um, so they're either false right. positives or false negatives. Primarily, it looks like false positives. Um, and so these tests, which claim absolute reliability, are only 15% reliable at best. Um, but one of the things that you had mentioned, um, or sort of one of the ways that you had reacted to this, was saying, um, was wanting to sort of push push into the way that this piece covered that um, study and the the implications behind this great scandal that they had uncovered about the unreliability of the tests. Um, do you want to talk just a little bit more about your thoughts about that? Sure. You, you know, one of the things that, um, you, you know, that Times piece was interesting, and I think it is important to understand both the unreliability of the micro deletions test, things which are taken as a potential, you know, marker which would require follow-up tests to, to verify are taken as sort of definitive, right? I mean, they're just sort of marketed in the, in the doctor's office as being definitive. And so there's both kind of a misunderstanding of what the tests are and then false positives that, you know, that come even in that context. Um, but, you know, one of the, and I don't know if I read this into the, into the piece or not, but if I did, it's, I read it into it based on, born out of my experience, I suppose, there, there did seem to be a sort of underlying presumption, you know, the way that stories were told, um, you know, this person got a false positive and um, they had an abortion. And if they had known the child didn't have the thing, they would, wouldn't have had an abortion. The, the presumption of a lot of the narrative was that, of course, if a child has, you know, a serious chromosomal or genetic abnormality, that um, abortion would be the, the right choice, um, you know, of, or of course, a parent who, who, who discovers that a child, you know, actually has some, some kind of, you know, very serious, perhaps fatal uh, chromosomal abnormality would do kind of the compassionate thing, as I think, you know, so many people look at it and, and, and choose an abortion. And, um, you know, and, and, and the problem with that presumption is, is how ubiquitous it is. Um, you know, we know I have two children with Down syndrome and, and our children with Down syndrome are, are adopted, but we've, we've gotten to know over the past 10 years, a lot of uh, Down syndrome families. And of course, we know the, the birth parents of our own children um, well, and we know their stories. And, and we know that, um, you know, those those micro deletions tests are, are effectively add-ons to the prenatal testing that looks for Down syndrome and other um, more commonly found sort of genetic abnormalities. And we know, you know, it's it's just very commonly understood kind of in the Down syndrome community among people who are religious and not religious, pro-life and not pro-life, uh, that... Um, when a woman gets a prenatal di diagnosis of Down syndrome, she's going um, very likely to experience um, that diagnosis, the reporting of that diagnosis as a negative. You know, in the doctor's office, she's going to hear, I'm sorry, your child has Down syndrome. And um, and then immediately, you know, be moved into sort of genetic counseling, which suggests the reasons why she ought to consider an abortion. And, and oftentimes the presumption of an abortion is, is just that, a presumption from the medical community. We can talk about scheduling termination and these kinds of things. Um, and, and we know that that, I mean, anecdotally, we know that that disproportionately is true for poor women. And, um, and I think probably there's some um, data that suggests that as well. But, um, again, it's, it's not just a sort of journalistic presumption in the New York times, but a broad sort of medical cultural presumption that, um, a person who has a prenatal diagnosis of Down syndrome is probably going to choose to have an abortion. And that might be the compassionate thing to do. Um, you know, it's probably better for everyone. And we see that just in the, in, in this country, we know that, you know, at least two thirds of children who receive a prenatal diagnosis of abortion, indeed, or excuse me, of Down syndrome, indeed, um, are are the subjects of abortion. So, um, so that presumption, you know, really has a toehold in in the way that we think about these tests from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I thought was quite chilling, um, which one was one of the things that you tweeted about this, was a. Uh, one of the quotes from this piece, um, Natera, which is one of the companies that does these screenings, particularly for Down syndrome, um, has performed more than 2 million screenings for Down syndrome since 2013. It went public in 2015, and the value of its stock has grown to $8.8 billion. And the, what you had drawn from that was the idea that $8.8 .8 for at least this company, 
is the value that we as that our economy places on avoiding parenting children with children like your two oldest children like that is so it, it, it is so highly valued to avoid parenting those children that that we as a, a political economy think it's worth that much it's a little bit of, uh, you know, it's in a little bit of an emotional reaction, the reaction of a dad, because, of course, the company has other kinds of testing and things like this. But it is the um, <laughs> the avoiding Down syndrome industry is a big industry and has um, and has done a very good job, you know, kind of um, making ordinary the notion um, in the doctor's office that the right thing to do is to choose to have an abortion um, if you have a child with Down syndrome and. Um, and you see the way that that's get, that that gets presented, kind of culturally, and um, and and you know, of course, that's not like to indict, you know, every doctor who offers prenatal testing to to, to pregnant moms or even moms who who have prenatal testing. But the way that we think about this and and the the size of the industry um, and the results of that industry. I mean, the most immediate result of um, uh, of the the ubiquitous practice of prenatal testing is that two thirds of children in this country who are diagnosed with Down syndrome, under, you know, are aborted. And um, and so I don't think we can sort of bracket off that consequence from um, from the you know kind of ubiquity of that kind of testing or um, how profitable it's become. A lot of these sort of uh, specific micro deletions result in you know there are some obviously where um, children are diagnosed with conditions that mean that they're not expected to live past you know very long past birth, but. A, a, a great number of them are for things like Down syndrome or for like lifestyle, like almost lifestyle mm -hmm. choice, child yeah. types, like it, which is a creepy yeah. way to put it. But it just it, the whole framing of the the piece did kind of make it sound like these are affluent, pr predominantly affluent. Um, the, at least the people in the Times piece seem to be pr predominantly affluent people who have controlled a great deal about their lives and are now running into something that they can't, you know, they possibly can't control. And, you know, they, they want to be able to edit the type of child or the, you know, the genre of child that they're given. Right. That's kind of the, the vibe that I was getting from that. Yeah, it's my expectation that Down syndrome in this country is going to become increasingly kind of the purview of either kind of weirdly religious families like my weirdly religious family or um, of, uh, of, of people from um, uh, um, lower income classes, from, uh, of poor people and rural people who are, who are not um, conditioned in a sort of technocratic sense of being able to master and control nature even to the point of um, designing their families in the way that seems sort of most consonant with their lifestyle. Um, you know, I, I, you, you might already see that. I, I, I don't know, but I think that's probably where kind of um, the existence of Down syndrome is going because sort of the ordinary um, mode of an upper middle class or middle class, well-educated, technocratic family is precisely that we can control everything. And so when you introduce something which sort of um, undermines the, uh, the the expectations or plans for that family, you know, um, even the way it's so interesting, even the way that sort of the Down syndrome community talks about kind of um, uh, you know, when you have a kid with Down syndrome, um, when you have a baby with Down syndrome, people sort of reach out to you a lot to sort of talk to you about how you're doing with that and, and these kinds of things. The presumption is that this is a, a, hard, a challenge, and indeed it is. Um, but, you know, the, the conversation is often sort of like, well, you know, although you have to mourn that your child probably won't be going to the same college as you, or although you have to mourn sort of your career hopes for your child, you know, the child will still have a life that's worth living. And, and, and you see in that kind of the values that um, you, you see in that a, a weird reflection of kind of the values that are presumed to exist for, for ordinary, I guess, um, middle class or upper middle class families, which are entirely focused on productivity, um, you know, career uh, affluence, the social status of, you know, university attendance and these kinds of things. Like, I, those weren't kind of the things that I hope for my kids anyway, because those same things mostly seem kind of stupid. Um, but, you know, that you can see kind of in the way that people sort of try to console you about Down syndrome, like sort of the institutional Down syndrome universe tries to console you about Down syndrome, you, you see a reflection sort of of those technocratic ideals, I think. I hadn't realized how recent a lot of this this kind of technology, um, or at least the, the widespread rollout of, of this kind of biotechnology is. Um, the piece said that basically it's only within the last 10 years that this level of screening, um, where it's a bit bespoke, like you can decide that you want to screen pay more and screen for more things. Um, right. that, that, that kind of regime has only been around for about 10 years. It almost seems like a preview of um, 
the kind of world we'll, we'll live in, uh, you know, after CRISPR style gene editing, you know, comes into being, um, where, as you're saying, to have a, a, a child with Down syndrome becomes a, a choice, a, a, some, something that you either choose to do because you're kind of weird, uh, Christian or conservative, uh, or otherwise just um, a little a little different than the norm, or because you don't have the money to pay for, uh, to pay to avoid, so to speak, substandard children from the point of view of this te technocratic mindset. Or, or you don't have this kind of technocratic idealism that tells you that that's important. And that's where I say, you know, perhaps the respite of, 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 um, uh, of, for people with Down syndrome will be in, in communities that are, you know, lower income, rural, um, that in, in some ways perhaps carry, um, a more kind of a sense of, a sense of what it is to be human than the way in which technocracy has kind of challenge that for all of us. The other thing uh, that is just always remarkable in pieces like this is the um, the sort of language games or the language ambiguity that's always here. So I think the this is like the first paragraph in the piece talked about this woman who after a year of fertility treatments was after, you know, after they had a normal ultrasound, she was confident enough to tell her three-year-old son his quote brother or sister, and it's in quotes, was in her belly. Um, Later on, there's a woman who talks about, um, you know, seeing the ultrasound of her child who she thinks is, um, wrongly believes in this case, is is positive for a um, condition that would mean that they would die shortly after birth. And with no quotes around the, the word child, the phrase is, she cried because she thought that this was the only time that she would see her child moving. Um, and then there's other, you know, parts of the piece where these children are talked about as fetuses or, you know, as sort of essentially genetic material. So just this total inability, even within the bounds of one, you know, fairly carefully researched and put together piece to decide what, what we're talking, like, who are we talking about people? Are we not talking about people? Are we talking about, you know, let's, let's say brother or sister in the way that you would say in my belly, meaning like as, as a kind of like yeah. baby talk or imprecise way of talking about what's real. Plus, you're kind of surprised they would impose a gender binary on the kid, right? I mean, geez. Exactly, exactly right. <laughs> Do you want to talk about just a, a sort of your life path, your and your wife's life path to adopting your two oldest children? And Just before I do that, if I can, you know, one of the things that we've kind of talked about is that, you know, that the New York Times piece talked about people who would um, maybe have sort of terminal genetic conditions, conditions in which they might not live for very long after birth at all. And then, and then, uh, you know, other people would have the kind of genetic conditions that are, that define their lives in, in very many ways, but are, you know, not as such or terminal. Um, and, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know if you know anybody who has, um, who has had the experience of losing a child shortly after birth. Um, maybe the child had a genetic disability like trisomy 13 or something like that, or, or maybe they didn't. Um, it, it is, um, you know, it's one of those moments of just profound and raw and, and real and human um, pain for families. Um, it's interesting because, it, you know, obviously infant mortality used to be much higher. That used to be a much more common, I think, though no less um, profound and difficult experience. But it, it, it's a, the, the, um, the, the sort of um, ubiquitous desire to avoid that kind of experience, the absolute certitude that sanitizing that experience is the right path for everyone you know, um, it, it is ultimately a desire to, you know, to avoid the pain of kind of going through this in a, in a more, um, you know, in a more visceral way. And probably for a lot of people, that's because they don't feel like they have the tools to go through that in, in a visceral way. Um, they don't have kind of the sense of the, me of, of life's meaning, perhaps, or suffering's meaning, or sense of the transcendent. And, um, and so we should see in that, I think, you know, just um, an impoverished idea of what it is to be a human. Of course, everybody wants to avoid suffering when they can, but, but if you're fortunate enough to know that suffering can have meaning and, you know, if, you, if you've ever seen families invite siblings into the loss of a, of a newborn child, um, it's a, it, it's, it's something which can be defining and, and, and even unifying in a, in a profoundly kind of, um, um, vulnerable and, and, and raw way that is, is, is again, part of the, just part of the human experience, which has allowed us to, I think in so many ways, b build, the, the, the culture that we have and, and, and even build kind of great and beautiful things in Christian culture to know that suffering has meaning. And so the poverty of people, you know, the poverty of a sort of culture that says we absolutely have to avoid this thing should, should um, you know, should give us pause. Um, 
anyway, with that said. No, no, no. That's that's definitely something that I'm, I'm glad you hit that because I didn't want to sort of one way to read this is like, well, you know, if if there are children who have sort of things like Down syndrome where they are perfectly capable of having like wonderful lives, then we should right. accept them. But if there's a child who, you know, is going to die anyway shortly after birth, almost certainly, then it's a, a, it's a more understandable choice. And obviously, you know, if if everything's understandable, but the idea that, you know, it's easier to deal with the death of a child if you control when that death happens and you can sort of pretend that it wasn't a child um, or that you can just sort of tidy things away more efficiently um, through getting an abortion um, rather than waiting for the child to die in his or her or God's time. Um, mm-hmm. That is another kind. It's exactly that. It's it's making, um, it's sending a message to yourself and to your potentially other children and to everyone else that this is how we should think about our, you know, our, our children. That, you know, they are, what we ought to do is tidy them away if they're going to cause us emotional pain um and kind of deny that they ever actually existed the same thing i think that we do with you know the kind of growing tendency towards euthanasia of people with dementia um you know living with someone who has long-term dementia is is a terrific cross i mean just a a really serious terrible cross in many ways um it's also the kind of thing that helps us to better understand what it is to be a person and um, helps us i think to fulfill the end of being a person which is um, you know, to love in a way which is beyond um, our perceived capacity for love, and um, and and to deny ourselves those things is to deny ourselves the kind of um, uh, the the kind of grace and um, and uh, capacity that comes with um, the demands of love, right? I mean, we're, we when we when we're in a situation, even the situation of a child who will be born and then uh, live only for a very short time, and we have this you know profound outpouring. Of love and intimacy, and then mourning and grief, um, th- those are the those are the human things, and we're better um, we're, we're better for them, even even well before we kind of know that, you know. So, um, so my kids, sorry, that was um, my kids. Uh, so my wife and I got married in two thousand six, and in January of two thousand six, we just had our anniversary, um, and uh, um, you know, we we. Um, <laughs> We were pretty young when we got married. We were pretty devout. We went to Steubenville, which is a sort of very devout Catholic college. We thought that, you know, um, we would be kind of the stereotype of devout young Catholic kids who have like a lot of kids. And um, and we were excited about that. And then we didn't, um, you know, we um, we tried to get pregnant and, and, you know, we didn't we didn't get pregnant. And so kind of dealt with infertility for several years. And my wife had a couple of surgeries to address, you know, some medical issues, Um along the way, um, but um, it just wasn't in um, in the path of providence that we would get pregnant then or that we would stay pregnant then. We had some miscarriages along the way. And so after a couple of years of trying um, to have kids, and and really, you know, infertility is a difficult thing, as, as maybe you guys know if you, if you know people who have experienced infertility, and it can be really... Um, um, uh, difficult on a, you know difficult on a marriage and and alienating in a marriage and um and uh we we just saw after a while that like in, in a certain way if you come from the kind of um the kind of catholic community that we come from where sort of big families are the norm and big families are the basis of social life and things like that you know you can sort of in a certain way uh, in in the in the in the aim of trying to um have a baby you can it can become a kind of idolatry right um in which that becomes sort of the um the goal uber alles and um and uh and uh you know um it, you separate that from every other aspect of your your married life and it just becomes not a healthy thing so it wasn't a healthy thing for us anymore and so we kind of took a break from that and um it uh, the first time we we kind of decided that we would pursue adoption we really weren't ready for it because we were sort of pursuing adoption as a substitute for not being able to have a baby and um um, you know, so we had kind of these, we, we had a lot of the woundedness of not being able to have a baby and the impacts of that on our marriage. And, um, we, um, you know, carried a lot of that into the adoption process. And so we were, you know, ourselves, I think very, um, raw and had a lot of unresolved issues kind of there. And so, um, you know, adoption is not fundamentally about you and it's not about the acquisition of a baby to make you feel better about yourself. Um, it's, um, ad- adoption, however it happens is, um, uh, 
is about a, a child who, who who needs a home and needs the stability of a home and, and the stability of, of a, f- a family life. And, um, and you can't, um, you can't sort of commodify that. And we could see that that was kind of where we were at first. So we started kind of down the adoption path and then we took a little break and we kind of mourned, um, what our hopes were for our own family and kind of what our, what our sort of, we sort of put on the cross as it were, our sort of perceptions about what we thought our family life would be like and just try to open ourselves more um, to what we thought God's plan for our family life might be. And, um, and then after, after we kind of did that for a while, maybe six months or something like that, we went back to adoption. And, um, you know, when you, when you, um, when you, we, um, we adopted our children from, um, uh, kind of through an adoption agency. We live in Colorado, an adoption agency here in Colorado, kind of an ordinary adoption agency. And, um, so when you, um, and our children were born in Colorado, um, when you, uh, when you adopt a child, you know, you have the kind of home study process and all these things. And then there comes a certain point where there's this very weird thing that you have to do, which is you have to basically fill out a form. Uh, it's a checklist of effectively, and you have to sort of check off the kind of child you would be open to having. And, um, you know, what, what kind of child are you open to adopting? Which is weird. I mean, it, it feels a little bit too much like an order form. Uh, right. And, um, and so our sort of, um, MO with that was, um, to approach it with the idea that any kind of child whom we could conceive, we should be open to adopting because, um, again, because this, we're not, you know, we didn't want to be consumers about it and we wanted to be as open to having children, um, in whatever way God would give them to us as we would, um, when we were, you know, when we were trying to have a baby biologically. And, uh, and so, you know, there are, they list kind of all these conditions and we just sort of checked off all the conditions that, we thought, well, these are things where we could have a baby who, you know, we could conceive a baby who would have these things. So, of course, we should be open to adopting a baby who would have these things. And then, um, you know, some other conditions that are not um, th- that are not by bi- that are not genetic, you know, like fetal alcohol syndrome or um, prenatal exposure to drugs or things like that. We tried to be as open as we possibly could be, you know, while recognizing that there were sort of certain very serious um, kind of medical conditions that, like, we were like twenty six or something like this when we were doing this that we probably and we didn't have any money so like we recognized that there were certain things we just didn't have the capacity to like the material capacity to to be able to um sort of sign up for um so anyway so we heard we'd handed in our form and um <laughs> we weren't sort of trying to adopt a child with down syndrome or any other kind of genetic condition at all we were just wanting to adopt a baby and uh so um you know we waited and we had um we were matched with one um uh uh, mom who was going to have a baby. And, and, uh, then when she had the baby, she decided to, um, to parent the baby, which was really hard for us, but also good because it helped us to, um, it was a good reminder for us of the, um, the, the, that the, the natural family is the, is the, is the ordinary thing and the appropriate thing. And, you know, that it's actually a good thing if a, if a mother is able to raise her child and that we should be, you know, that that's a natural order of things and that, you know, social, you know, sort of as a society, we should be more invested in that than, than anything else. Like the, you know, the integrity of the natural family. So though that was hard for us, it was also, I think, a good sort of attitude check for us. Um, so, uh, so then, so that was probably, let's see, Labor Day of 2011. Then, um, in no, in December of 2011, at the beginning of December, our adoption agency called us and they said there was a lady who, um, who was going to have a baby and, um, the baby had Down syndrome, and um, she actually wasn't working with our adoption agency, but it was then that we learned that here in Colorado, where we lived, of all sort of the families who were waiting to adopt a baby, there were only two families who said that they were open to adopting a child with Down syndrome, which we were, you know, sad to hear. Um, and so we said we would be, you know, we'd be a- a- open to adopting him, and, you know, we'd like to move forward and those kind of things. And so we started kind of, we didn't know anything about Down syndrome. Like, I don't know that I ever really met or had a conversation with a person who had Down syndrome before that. Um, so what did we do is we watched a bunch of YouTubes kind of about Down syndrome and, uh, read some books and talked to some people and we were pretty, you know, we were kind of getting very kind of in, in, excited about the baby and, and, and these kinds of things. And then, um, right after Christmas of 2011, no, right before Christmas of 2011, our adoption agency called us and they said that the baby had been born and his mother had decided to parent him. And, uh, and, and so again, you know, we, we tried to be kind of very glad about that and thanks be to God and the integrity of the natural family. But, you know, um, we, we were mostly just saying it <laughs> because we didn't, you know, we were really, we had our heart, I think, set in a certain way and we thought this was going to happen. So it was Christmas. So we sort of tried, we like looked at the crash and we sort of told the baby Jesus in the crash, like, well, you're the only baby that we need, but I don't think we meant it. Um, well, um, 
a couple days after Christmas, our adoption agency called us and they said it wasn't going to work for her to parent um, the baby. And did we still want him? And so we were in Chicago and we got on a plane to to uh, to Colorado that day. And we drove up um, to, to Fort Collins or to, to Greeley, Colorado, where he was born the next day. We met with his birth mom. Um, we met her at a diner. We ordered pie, and she ate. My, she decided she liked my pie more than her pie, so she ate it. And you know what? Are you, what are you going to say in that situation? So I let her have it. Um, and then we went and uh, and met met the baby. And um, gosh, it was just. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 the beautiful experience of becoming a parent for the first time. However, it happens. You know, we saw our son, and he saw us, and he was in the NICU, and. He was on oxygen and he had some feeding problems and Max has, um, has Down syndrome, but he also has some other serious neurological problems. And, uh, and so, you know, he, he had some challenges and, but we, we just saw our, our son and, um, uh, he had a different name. She had given him a different name. Um, but she said, you know, that we can name him what, what we wanted to name him. And, and so we were all in the NICU for a few days, you know, kind of getting to know the baby and, and Max's birth mom was there and we were there and everything. And, and then it came time for, um, uh, for, for, it was the time when we were going to take him home the next day, you know, and kind of visiting hours were ending and, and suddenly it was, she was a visitor, you know, which was a sort of a role reversal all of a sudden. And so, um, she asked if she could have a little bit of time with him. And so, um, they were sitting in a chair in the NICU and she was talking with him about all the things that she wanted for, um, his life and all the things she hoped for him and these kinds of things. And just, it was a, they were just sitting together. And so Kate and I went to get some coffee and we didn't have a car seat. So we went to buy a car seat, um, and some baby clothes and stuff, uh, cause we didn't have any of that. And we came back and, and she was still there and she was just holding him and she was crying. And, and so we were kind of waiting in the other side of Max's little NICU room, um, uh, and uh, kind of leaning against the counter. And she stood up and she, it's probably 10 feet, uh, watching her walk those 10 feet, um, from where she was in the chair to where we were, it was like Mary walking with Jesus to the cross, you know, like this is the whole way of the cross, this mother who is going to put her son in someone else's arms, you know, and leave. And uh, we just saw in that a kind of selflessness that was incredible. I mean, we just, we realized, we talked about it later, we realized we wanted to sort of model our, the whole of our parenting in the 10 feet of her walking across that room to give her son up. Um, and, uh, and she did, she put the baby in Kate's arms and she gave Kate a hug and, and she left. So we named him Maximilian Colby because Maximilian Colby made a life-giving sacrifice for someone else. And, and so did she. And we wanted to honor that. Um, so that was Max. And, um, you know, we took him home and, um, you know, a lot to learn and, you know, oxygen and therapies and these kinds of things, but, um, but a great time. And then about a year later, a little less than a year later, we got a call from our adoption agency. It was like early December of 2012. We got a call from our adoption agency, and they said that it was a Thursday. They said that a, a couple had come in that morning, and they were going to have a baby, and the baby had Down syndrome, and they were hoping for two things in an adoptive family, that the adoptive family would already know about Down syndrome and that they would be devoutly Catholic. And did we know anybody? And uh, so, like, um, we called kind of our, our confessor, our, our, the priest who, who is a spiritual advisor to us, and we said, like, well, we think we're going to adopt this baby. Do you think that's very prudent? He said, like, no, I don't think it's especially prudent, but I know you guys are going to do it. And, um, you know, thanks be to God for that. So um, we decided we would try to adopt uh, the baby. And so we went and we met her birth parents the next day and and talked with them. And, and they decided that, you know, they would make an adoption plan and we would adopt her. And so our daughter Pia was born uh, December 9th, 2012, um, uh, here in Colorado. And, and we it was a little bit different because we, we met her on the day she was born and... and um, these kinds of things. And she stayed in the hospital for a couple of days and then, and then we took her home. And, um, and again, the selflessness of her birth parents, um, you know, was just, was the thing that stands out to us the most about that. They knew that they knew that their, that their child needed things that they couldn't give and, and they made a different choice. Um, and you know, to, to have to admit that I think would be incredibly difficult for any of us. So, um, Pia has been, um, hmm. Uh, Pia, five days after Pia was born, she was diagnosed with a kind of uh, cancer, a rare kind of cancer called transient myeloproliferative disorder. And it's a kind of leukemia that only children with Down syndrome get. And there's really no treatment for it. So either you get better, which most people do, or, or, or it's terminal. Those are kind of the, the options, as it were. So um, we found out about it at Pia's five-day checkup, and she was admitted to the hospital. And it was incredibly providential that we had her five-day checkup when we did and that we didn't delay it because she had two heart attacks that night in the hospital. And if she had been at home, you know, she would have died. Um, 
but she was in the hospital and, and, um, and so her, you know, doctors rushed in and, and, um, were working on her actually when she had the second heart attack. So, she, so saved her life. And, uh, we spent, um, a couple of months in the hospital with the TMD and then she did get better, which is the, the common course of things. And, uh, and then, um, uh, uh, shortly after she got better, we moved to Nebraska because of work, and and then um, and then uh, on Pia's first birthday, she she just been a little bit sick, uh, seemed a little bit sick, seemed like she had the flu. So we took her to the doctor on her first birthday, and she was diagnosed with another kind of leukemia, with a more typical you know kind of leukemia. And so she and Kate spent about a year um, uh, living in the oncology ward of uh, Children's Hospital in Omaha. We lived in Lincoln, Nebraska, and so it was about an hour back and forth. But Kate and Pia basically lived in the hospital for about a year, and. Um, and that was actually a surprisingly kind of blessed time for us. Um, um, you know, it was obviously a difficult time, but um, you see, but grace becomes, you know, where, where, where difficulties are, grace abounds all the more. I don't know how that goes, but, you know, there was, it was just a period of extraordinary grace for us in which we saw God's providence and, and um, the consolation of God in a lot of ways. And, and thankfully, you know, Pia, children with Down syndrome are more likely to get leukemia than other children, far more likely to get leukemia than other children, but they're also far more responsive to chemotherapy than other children. So it's more common for them to get it. It's also more common for them to get better, uh, which Pia did. And, um, and so she did. And so she came home and, um, and, uh, you know, that was now a long time ago. Um, their, their knowing and loving, um, children with disabilities has become, um, in a certain way that a defining aspect of my life and a transformational aspect of my life and the life of my wife. And, uh, and we're all the better for it. I guess that's kind of how they, how they got here. And, uh, lots of things have happened since then, I guess. If you'd be willing to, I'd kind of like to, um, I don't know, attach a picture of your kids, like all of your kids. Do you want to talk about your, your youngest? Yeah. Poor guy. <laughs> We talk about, you know, Down syndrome a lot and people ask us your talks and stuff and that guy, you know, he never gets in the talk. So thanks for asking. I'm really grateful. So, um, so we did, you know, um, so several years later, you know, my wife said to me, you know, she said, I think we should start praying again that we will have a baby. And, uh, and I didn't want to pray for that because I didn't think, you know, that we would, it would happen. And so I just thought it would be a lot of emotional up and down to be praying for something. And I didn't basically didn't want to get our hopes up in any meaningful way whatsoever, you know, um, and so, um, and so I said to Kate, I don't really want to pray. I don't want to pray for that. I don't want us to, to do that. I think we just have to, you know, this is where God has us and da, da, da. And Kate said, well, I'm going to pray for it anyway. And, um, and so, um, Kate went to the canonization of Mother Teresa and whatever year that was. And, um, and Mother Teresa was known to be a, like a great intercessor for infertile couples. I didn't, I didn't know that, but apparently Mother Teresa was a big intercessor for infertile couples when she was alive. And, and I had her canonization. Kate prayed that we would get pregnant and, um. And we did the next month. Um, so I guess uh, score score one for Kate. <laughs> um, you know, it came as a total surprise, certainly to me. I think it came as it still came as a surprise to her. Um, we only kind of even entertained the possibility. I only started entertaining the possibility that she was pregnant and should take a pregnancy test because one Sunday after mass, she wanted she was she asked me to go out and like get hamburgers for lunch. And then while I was going to get them, she texted me and said that I should get. A fries from a different place because the fries were much better from that place but the ketchup at that place was bad so I should stop at the grocery store and get a different kind of ke ketchup and I realized like this is only what a pregnant woman says so I came home I said I think you're pregnant so we took a pregnancy test the next day and turned if we were and so our son Daniel Casey is uh is four and is um um yeah great a, a great blessing a totally unexpected and, and great and beautiful blessing and you know he he's kind of Davey's kind of growing up we call him Davey um he's kind of growing up kind of kind of weird you know, it's, it's, um, um, children with Down syndrome for a variety of reasons are typically kind of born to women who are older. And so, you know, oftentimes they're sort of, if they have siblings, they're at the tail end of the siblings, you know, they're the youngest in a family, in a, in a family of other siblings. And so, um, you know, to have two older siblings who have Down syndrome, um, is an unusual thing. And, uh, and so, you know, he, he's interesting because they do, they just do things very differently than most people do. And they, play a lot differently than most kids play and think about things a lot differently than most kids think. And he, it, it doesn't occur to him that it's different. You know, it's just how his brother and sister are. And in a certain way, you know, how they are is even how he, he wants to be, you know, he'll come to us sometimes and, 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 and in a certain way ask why he doesn't do, th why he can't do th things the same way that Maxine Pia can or things like that. And, and so in, in, for him, you know, that's not, he, he's beginning to recognize that they're different, but the difference is not, 
it's for him a deficiency. It's it's um, it, it wouldn't occur to him because it's normal. Um, and so it's really a beautiful thing. You know, I, I've sometimes worried like, will he um, will he resent that? Will he resent over time? Kind of the time, you know, the amount of attention that they require and the way in which they can be. You know, as I said, Max has a, lo- a lot of other neurological problems, and so sometimes those can be disruptive on ordinary family things or the things that Davy wants to do. Um, you know, and I've kind of wondered, will he resent that? And, and I, you know, of course we can't know, but, you know, thus far I've been really kind of edified and actually really kind of blown away by the degree of, um, a virtue that he has and the way in which he responds to them. And, and, um, and again, kind of the way in which they are, um, completely normal to him. So, he, you know, there'll be, there'll be, you know, sometimes Max has sort of, um, uh, shouts a lot because of some of his other neurological problems and, he'll just sort of get upset about something and, and start shouting about it and things like that. And it's funny, you can sort of watch and you think like, boy, if anybody else walked in here, they would like call the police. But there's Davy just kind of watching um, Peter Pan and not even noticing this kid sort of sitting on the couch shouting in his ear right next to him or whatever. You know, it's kind of kind of amazing. Um, but uh, yeah, so he um, so he's a great blessing and, and a great gift to our family, for sure. There are myths about Down syndrome that are not helpful, that people with Down syndrome are sort of um, angels with perfect wills and that their God sends them here to teach us all lessons about how to be nice and things like that. It's not true. People with Down syndrome are people with ordinary, an ordinary range of human emotion, ordinary social and emotional needs and, um, and, 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 and those kinds of things. Um, but, but still, if we don't, if we've never seen a person with Down syndrome and we get a prenatal diagnosis, you know, the thing which is foreign is far easier to fear. So that's part of the reason why we try and put our kids on social media and things like that as much as we can. So. Well, that's great. Yeah. Thanks for telling about him. Yeah. JD, thank you so much for coming on. And um, this has just been fantastic. And uh, we encourage our readers to, our listeners, I guess, to follow you uh, on Twitter and to follow your work at The Pillar. And um, yeah, let's stay in touch. And thank you so much again. Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes or your app of choice and give us those five-star ratings. Tune in next week for a conversation with Plough contributor and adult convert to Orthodox Judaism, Kelsey Osgood, and with Leah Labresco, adult convert to Catholicism, a dear friend, much published Plough author, and, in fact, contributing editor to Plough.